Hi, Ian. Hello. Jay, do we sit on his lap? No, I think we should just do the whole interview like this. Then oh, just to the camera, just yeah. me and you. Hi, Ian. Yeah. How you doing? Hey, Adam. This should be the final. <laughs> <laughs> APC World fans, Adam here with Dr. Ian Cutris of Tech Tech Potato fame. I'm here to talk to you about something that uh, is a little nebulous. You know, I, but I, I thought I'd sit down with an expert and figure it out. Uh, CPU degradation. Now, last year we know, uh, you know, all of the AM5 based CPU stuff mm -hmm. with voltages increasing. Uh, this year there's rumblings about uh, high end Intel Core i9 or i7 CPUs uh, hitting some, some major power spikes, things like that, causing crashing. Out of all of this, I think there's a lot of people who sit and wonder. Dang, is my is my CPU hurt now? Should I be worried? Yeah, yeah. Should I be worried? Is, is it in the long term? Have I just shaven a couple years off of the life of the CPU? First question is: Is CPU degradation a thing? It is a thing. It is a thing. It okay. happens uh, in the same way that the wind blows. Oh, okay. Well, okay, okay. But I think most people would then jump to the conclusion: If it's a thing, then how bad of a thing is it? Because, yeah. it, sure, okay, maybe it's a yeah. thing, but maybe we're talking about shaving off a couple days of the, the yes. overall life cycle, or are we literally talking about shaving off years of the potential life cycle of the CPU? It's Or is that the wrong way to think about it? it? It's a very complex topic to speak about because there are two methods of failure in any sort of electronic product. Okay. Either Immediate mm -hmm. or gradual, <laughs> yeah. right? Which and the immediate one, you know, the Intel stuff with uh, stuff crashing, that's kind of an immediate thing right now yeah. that people are seeing, but could lead to long term or the yeah. well, no, two no, separate no, things. No, no. So uh, in in terms of immediate, I'm saying that if it happens, that chip is dead. And oh, won't start. got it, okay. got it, got it. Okay. Um, and the way these chips are manufactured. Um, and we all know about binning and SKUs and how you have you know different voltage frequency levels on the chips. Silicon lottery. Yeah, but in terms of what that processor can actually physically take mm -hmm. in terms of voltage, that's also a spectrum. So you'll have some on the low end of that spectrum, some on the high end of that spectrum. Some of those cutoffs will be very exact. Some of them will be a broad you know a broad effect on on the degradation of uh, the chip. Wait, so are you saying some CPUs come off the line already degraded? No, no. So th th this is beyond the specifications. Oh, okay. The the, th the thing is we have to separate what's a specification and what's overclocked oh, in this wow. scenario because technically a turbo is also beyond the factory specifications in Intel yeah. land. Yeah. Um, that muddies the waters quite a bit. The reason this happens is due to a phenomenon called electromigration. Okay, please ex so, explain so, to me like I'm five. I don't so, know what that is. Uh, electro is in electrons okay, and migration as in moving. Okay, like but, birds flying to the south. Yeah. The point is, you have uh, any wire that's carrying electricity. You've got electrons, or technically electrons and holes, flowing through. Um, what you have, you have a, a lattice of metal atoms. Okay. And electrons flying through it. Okay. Um, and this happens, you know, seamlessly. At some point. When an electron has a high enough speed, it can nudge one of the metal atoms. And if it gets nudged too much, it displaces that metal atom. Permanently? Is it a permanent thing? It can be permanent. It could be a little wobble. Oh. It could be. But the point is, if it, it you, or, or you can do this, and it, uh, even if it is permanent, it has a negligible impact on what's happening. Mm. You get a slight increase in resistance because of how the physics works. Mm -hmm. The point the cutoff at which it no longer works is when the electrons no longer flow. And that's when you have extreme electromigration. Mm. Now, when we were designing circuits back in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, right, we'd put the lifespan of these things in terms of, you know, maybe one year, two year, three years, four years, because that's how long we expected the chip to you know, be within the warranty. Um, now, chips will last you know, 10, 15, 20, 25 years, unless you either have a gradual degradation or an immediate degradation. Mm -hmm. um, and the point of the silicon lottery is that it's hard to tell which is which. But one of the critical elements here is, yes, it happens, but is it a problem, right? So even if your chip slowly degrades and it's a, say, it's warranted for three years, but in a perfect world, it will live for 20, 
maybe going down to 18 over the first 10 years, you take off the, you know, it, it's, it's almost like smoking, right? <laughs> yeah. Yep, how yep, many okay. years does that take off the end of your mm, life? Yeah, yeah, Not, yeah. It doesn't take it off the beginning, it takes it off yeah, the yeah, end. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And, and electro migration happens regardless of what voltage you're running at. Okay. Right. It's just that when you're at the higher voltages, your electrons have more energy, and it's more likely to happen. Uh, okay. A modern chip has inputs of several vol several voltage rails, and then inside the chip, it will manage how those voltages are distributed. Okay. And with modern chips, where we have this fluctuating frequency, back in the 70s, 80s, 90s, if you were at 100 megahertz, you were at 100 megahertz the whole time. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Now we clock down to 800, then we go up to 1.6, then to 3.2, then to 4, then to 6 gigahertz. All within. Yeah, microseconds. Within microseconds. <laughs> and uh, a lot of, uh, especially GPUs, they will do this on the nanosecond scale based mm. on the power requirements of the workload you need. And the reason they do it this fast, that it changes this fast, is because to save power. And yeah, it's, okay. it's, it's uh, it, if you look, so if you have a GPU is 350 watts, the transient may be 600 watts for 15 nanoseconds, mm. and then it comes back down. Mm -hmm. And you've got power delivery and everything else involved in that. Um, so when you buy a processor, um, it will have a rating on the box. Back in the 2000s, the, rate, the voltage rating would be a range, right? They no longer put the voltage on the box or anything. But Intel or AMD or anybody else will ship a, ship, um, a processor and say, at this frequency, run at this voltage, or it'll be a, you know, a power limit scenario. And then it's up to the motherboard manufacturers to implement that specification. And as we all know, motherboard manufacturers do what they want regardless of what happens. A bigger bar better yeah. is what I usually hear. It's um, back in the 90s and early 2000s, we had this thing called clock skew. Hmm. So uh, it would go forward by a few megahertz, backwards by a few megahertz. Then we had multipliers. Mm -hmm. Um, and then that clock skew was happening again. It, when you have your base uh, frequency of 100 megahertz, sometimes it'll be 99.8, 99.6, but then sometimes it'll be 102 uh, or 100.2, and then we'd see some, some companies putting it to 102, so they get an extra 2% more performance hmm. versus what should be standard. Um, and I wrote an article in 2012 about uh, one company that was actually adding to the multiplier if you enabled XMP, so actually doing an out-of-the-box overclock that mm. sort of thing, mm. which of course raises the voltage. And then that, the question is, does that increase in voltage affect the life cycle of my product? Yes. And, and yeah. Yes, and, right. But, but again, we, we, we come to this, is it a straightforward death or is it a gradual decrease in lifespan? Um, and then how much, of, how much extra voltage is needed to have an effect? If it's five millivolts, it might not do a lot. If it's 25 millivolts, it might, do a lot, might not do a lot. But if it fundamentally hits a limit, if you've got that very binary cutoff, hmm. right? And the point is, the motherboard manufacturers don't know whether your processor has that gradu graduated line. Oh, it, so, yeah. So I used to be an extreme overclocker. We were pushing voltages. We were also using sub-zero temperatures. Um, and the point is, if you push the voltage too high, you're increasing the chance of this happen. Mm -hmm. You know, processors that would have been like 1.3 volts, we were putting 1.8 volts through, which is a sizable increase, yeah. right, just to get up to the higher frequencies. Um, but I've only ever killed one processor through voltage increases. Killed the immediate kill, not long term, though. Uh, to, to the point where I had to overvolt it just to get stock speeds. <laughs> um, yeah, RIP my Sandy Bridge i7. <laughs> um, but it, the, so when you have a processor modern today, mm. that's fluctuating between all these voltages all the time because your workload's changing, and then suddenly, which is what it's supposed to do. Which is what it's supposed to do. But then it's only of 1.1 volts. It's now doing 1.3 for you know the the. 10 minutes that you're doing a certain workload. Maybe, maybe you have MCE on in, yeah, in a... Yeah, uh, this multi-core um, uh, yeah, enhancement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, yeah, you, you know, people, by default, a lot of these come yeah. pre-configured that way, so a lot of people don't know to go in and turn some yeah. of that stuff off. So I would say most people are running it that way, yes. right? Yeah, you, you, uh, most people may buy Dell machines that don't implement it uh, at all. Okay. So, yeah, so, yeah, so, yeah, so, true, so true. It, it, it is a balance. Um, one of the issues is that as we get into more advanced processor node technology, mm -hmm. the wires do get smaller. Mm -hmm. So you have less metal atoms in that lattice mm -hmm. that you can knock out of the way. 
so your cutoff becomes more immediate. Interesting. So as as arguably as we get further you know into the future, that cutoff becomes more you know looking at this in this holistic way more immediate rather than gradual. Um, <laughs> Which I guess in some ways is better because then you know yeah, <laughs> now if, rather if, than being like, oh man, is it just going to die sooner? If it or dead, no, it's dead, just yeah. dead. Um, but it, it, in general, I don't tend to think of this as much of an issue for you know, 999,999 out of a million people. I, the, it, that actually, I, so I did ping Gordon, that was his first question was, how widespread is this? How many people should worry about this? Say, worst case scenario, you have all the bells and whistles on yeah. your motherboard, you have a high-end system that you're, you know, you, yeah. you had to get the best clocks for gaming, uh, you know, like how, how widespread should somebody worry about this? If you're not overclocking, don't worry. Well, but if FTE you, is technically an overclock. Onboard overclocks aren't enough really? to nudge the needle. Really? They shouldn't be enough. Oh, if somebody's done a major screw up, oh, if it is, okay, um, and you've got a premium gaming motherboard, you've paired it with a premium gaming CPU, and you've decided I don't want to know what it's running underneath, <laughs> um, then you might be in more danger than most. Okay. But anybody doing more overclocking than that, you know, more than say two, three hundred megahertz. Hmm. Then turn around and, and, and think about what fraction of a voltage are you increasing your chip by? Mm -hmm. um, because if, it's, if you're only doing it by increasing the voltage by 2%, by 5%, that might not be enough. If you're doing it by 30%. Oh. So, you, uh, know so, I mean? so, so it, it's, like it's got to be, it's it's be substantial. It's becoming less of an issue now because a lot of uh, processors run about the 1.1 you know, volt range anyway, and you can't actually go oh. up that high and yeah. well because I mean technically they're, they're it's almost like they're just overclocked from the factory yeah right? it's uh, they're already the companies are already pushing the high end the companies uh, it, it's what we call a, a voltage guard rail mm -hmm. you know don't go above this line the question is how do you determine where the line is and over time the companies have gotten smarter in how to detect where that line is that's why the Celeron 300 back in the day you could overclock it 50% or 100%. Because the line for them was way lower than yeah. it needed to be. Yeah, and now we're essentially riding right on uh -huh. the coattails of that line, and that's why there's no headroom for overclocking anymore. Hmm. Um, does that mean that we're at the headroom of the voltage limit as well? Probably probably not. These things are these things are fairly wide, and I think for most people it's not much of a concern. It may be on the GPU side. Hmm. So. Well, what about, does this apply, yeah, I guess that's a, a good follow-up, does this apply across the board? So, I mean, some people, especially with the, the early days of DDR5, mm -hmm. memory controllers were having problems. Yeah. Is this the same when you're talking about actual CPU cores versus memory controllers versus GPU cores, things so, like that? So, so memory controllers are a great example of um, investing in a new platform, mm -hmm. right? The memory controller, the, the intellectual property, the design of that memory controller, um, it goes through revisions over the life cycle and essentially gets more stable and hardened. We saw it with DDR3, we saw it with DDR4, we're seeing it with DDR5 now. Which means that in terms of that you know, gradual degradation I mentioned, that has historically happened worst on the memory controller of new platforms, as in that, that bell curve is very wide. Mm -hmm. um, which is why, yeah, I've, I've, you know, I've, the memory controller on the chip that went <laughs> was you know the, one of the biggest things to go um, so yeah th there's always c these companies only ever rate for stock and annoyingly it's the motherboard manufacturers we should all be annoyed at because there are people inside the company who think if I just push it 2% if I just push it 3% if I just push it 5% bigger bar is better um, you know, I speak, I've spoken to those engineering teams over years, and it's very interesting how quickly they forget what happened a couple of generations ago. Because somebody new will come into the team and they'll say, oh, let's try this. We haven't tried this in a couple of years. Mm. And they won't do the very classical Western thing of a post-mortem of why something happened and why we shouldn't do it again, mm. and why it should be <laughs> you know, not done moving forward. Um, and yeah, it's that uh, they all employ extreme overclockers as well, who say everything is fine. Oh, and that's part of the design as well. Um, yeah, it's uh, the minute I saw one of the motherboard manufacturers actually adding multipliers onto a CPU, it's like yeah, it's it, it's going a bit too far. 
Hmm. Okay. Well, so essentially, the I mean, the takeaway is though, if if you really care about having a CPU around for a long time, which I mean, is there any? What what is your sense of like what what's considered a long time? I mean, uh, you know, we all kind of know different <laughs> people who are like some people upgrade every couple of years, some people upgrade maybe every ten years. Do you, like, do, do you think even the people who hold on to a CPU for a long, long time should even be worried about it? Um, my current daily system is a 10-core um, Broadwell X high-end desktop, <laughs> okay. um, which is about seven years old at this point. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These chips are warranted usually for three years in most jurisdictions. However, the longevity, if you run them as the manufacturer prescribes, should be north of 10, which is well within most people's deployments. Um, and the fact that we used to say, well, you just pass your old systems down and you know, maybe it'll go to your parents or your grandparents to use your an kid. emailing yeah. machine. We're getting to a point now where modern mini set-top box PCs, you know, the sort of the quad-core atoms are now really, really nice and they're under 200 bucks. <laughs> Why would you give them something that could potentially break and fail and, you know, has seven Probably years worth of issues? power. And power. <laughs> Just buy this box, put an M.2 SSD in it and away you go. Hmm. And um, we're getting to the point where that sort of market is commoditized. Yeah. Um, so I don't think it's an issue for most people unless it breaks there and then. Well, so are you saying then, you know what, don't worry about it, go turn on all the enhancements and just not worry about it? No. Um, if a mother manufacturer's doing this, shout at them loudly, because otherwise they won't hear you in Taiwan. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, so are you saying then your recommendation is go in your UEFI and turn off all those, those boosting things? Um, yeah, if you can take the performance hit and you enjoy stability, uh, you know, as... Um, people are as as we age, we, th we tend to like stability a bit more. It's true. It's true. Um, if, if if you want to be on the bleeding edge and you want to be playing around with tweaking and settings and you really enjoy that, um, you have to take it as it comes. I think. All right. Last question then. Uh, how do you know? Say you suspect that there's degradation going on. Say you, oh, it just feels like you know, the, my motherboard pushed it too hard, and now mm -hmm. it's you know two years off its life. Is there a way to find out? Could, are there any tools that you can do to, to cross reference? Like, it's, oh, you know what? Some of these these metal lanes have been bumped. It's um, w w one of the things in in what we do in benchmarking is stress tests, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, I was a long time proponent of never put a stupid stress test on your system because you force it potentially down that road mm -hmm. uh, earlier than it needs to be. Mm -hmm. And with some of the early chips uh, in, in the early 2010s even, that could be an issue. You'd run a Prime 95 or a Fermark, and you'd lose a little bit of wiggle room in how far you could push your memory controller. or Just your by stress testing. Just yeah. by, <laughs> because those are artificial workloads that don't, that stress the CPU in a different way than everything else you'll ever run on it. That's what they're Which designed is the point. to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but it's ultimately artificial and not real world. So now a lot of us recommend real world stress testing. Yeah. yeah. Um, things like can you transcode video? Things like Cinebench, that sort of thing. Um, that the only way you're going to tell if something's going wrong these days is if you get crashes and blue screens and you spend a week trying to figure out what piece of hardware it is. It's not, it's not the memory, it's not the GPU, it's not your storage, it's not your power supply, it's definitely not your motherboard. Um, it, it, it becomes essentially you know, the law of you've tested everything, so the only other result must be the CPU. Mm. Um, but reinstall your OS is usually a, a yeah. good first step. Ah, OK, all right. Well. Yeah. I don't know if you made me feel any better about this, but I mean, I, I was somebody who, you know, uh, strives for stability anyway. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I guess you know, it's one of those things. It is one of those things. I think that increasingly we are seeing the motherboard manufacturers play fast and loose with this to get bigger scores, things it's, like that. Uh, so if you're worried about it, turn that stuff off. As we move to chiplets mm -hmm. and stuff, and, and as that propagates through desktop, and you know, it's in some laptop processors already. The fine lines in what the motherboard vendors can tweak, they're going to get very narrow. Mm -hmm. um, so you won't be able to tweak it that much. So in effect, that induces stability. 
Oh, oh, okay. Oh, so they, it kind of course corrects a little bit. Yeah. Uh, until yeah. they figure out something else to, to push it harder. And that's the key <laughs> point, until they figure it out. <laughs> until they figure it out. Okay, uh, well, I guess when they do figure it out, we'll come back and do another video on it. So, uh, yeah, thank you, Ian, for talking with me it, about this, because you know way more yeah. than I do, so it's, I needed to. I'll, I'll, I'll ring a bell and say, bring out your dead chips. Bring out your dead chips. It's just merely a flesh wound. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's what my CP tells me all the time. I, I took an arrow uh, to my decoder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, we got we got to wrap this up. Thank you, Ian. Thanks everybody for watching. If you want more fun conversational kind of videos like this, then subscribe here on PC World. Go over to Tech Tech Potato if you want the the actual real deep content, because that's what you're gonna get over there. Uh, until then, we will see you in the next video. Goodbye. <laughs>